As New Testament believers, there is a very clear call in Scripture for us to love others. If you ever have any doubt about that, if you ever have any question about that, read through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Among other things, those scriptures, those texts will clearly talk about the role of love in a believer's life. The love that we're not only supposed to show to our family and our friends, but certainly to our fellow believers. Even the love we're supposed to show to our enemies and the love we're supposed to show to those that we don't even know which sometimes is one of the most difficult things for us. How do you show love to a stranger? Anyhow, read through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It will talk about love because we are to emulate God's love. We are to show His love to others. That's one of God's unchanging attributes, that uh, love that He has for us, His creation. Even though he grieves deeply over our sin, his love for us as people is absolutely unending. And truly, God's love is beyond anything that we can humanly comprehend. Understand my comment there. We have things that we think of when we talk about love we have our opinions what love is but the depth of pure godly love is not something we will truly understand this side of heaven his love for us is that intense that deep when we read through the old testament we get a glimpse of God's love in action for his people. We see how he delivered his people from their enemies. We see it when he provided water and manna and protection for all those complaining Israelites out in the desert. We see his love in tangible ways. In fact, most everything that God does for his people is evidence of the love that he has for them he longs to protect them to care for them to keep his chosen safe even if they don't see it that way or even if they don't understand it that way he is displaying his love to them the same thing is true in the new testament over and over again god displays his love for an undeserving people and yes i'm talking about you and i we are blessed because of god's love but we're not deserving of his love we are sinners we are the people that have disobeyed him and rejected him on any number of occasions in our own lives some continue to do that today they even go so far as to reject god's son who was sent here just for them just for you and I. It's that love that God has for us that continues to pour out uh, on every one of us, encouraging us, teaching us, drawing us in, strengthening us. It's that love which he has for his creation that stands behind the redemptive provision he has given for us sinners. It's his love for all that is the reason he promised a Messiah to come. That's what drove the Messiah to be here on earth is God's love. By the way, Messiah, let me just throw this in there for just a second. Messiah means Savior or Liberator. Sometimes as Christians, as believers, we're guilty of using too much Christian ease. We speak and talk words that not everybody understand or grab onto. And we need to be mindful of that. When we start talking to people and they don't know what we're talking about, it's because we're probably using too much Christian ease. 
So when we talk about the Messiah, we're talking about the Savior, our Savior, the one who delivers us from sin and death. We're talking about a liberator, one who sets his people free from the bondage that they are in, that bondage of sin and death. We sang Amazing Grace this morning, talking about my chains are gone. It's the liberator, the Messiah, that breaks those chains and sets us free. The promise of the Messiah in the Old Testament was a very well-received promise. People got excited when they heard about a Messiah. They looked forward to this liberator coming to set them free. So when the prophets spoke about the Messiah, people would rejoice in the idea of that deliverer coming, and they looked forward to that deliverer in their day. Yet when the Messiah actually came, they didn't listen to him. They didn't pay attention to him. They didn't receive him. They did not even recognize him as the Messiah. Instead, they rejected him. They pushed him away. And unfortunately, that still happens today. This is one of the reasons we have been looking at Old Testament prophecies and connecting them to New Testament fulfillment. It's to solidify our understanding of Jesus as the Messiah. It's giving us understanding so that we can share the good news with others who still doubt or question Jesus as the Messiah or the Savior of the world. Today we know and we understand Isaiah to be one of the greatest prophets, right? As we read through his book, as we read through that text, we see a tremendous amount of uh, prophetic word spoken in that book. And, and much of what is written there is, is re in regard specifically to the coming of the Messiah, what to look for, what to expect, what you're going to when the Messiah comes. He lays it all out there for us to read through so that when that Messiah arrives in, in that time, people would recognize him. We talked about this before, seeing the signs, reading the signs, understanding the signs that they had been given. We also have to understand that many, before Jesus, many came claiming to be the Messiah. Many came saying, yeah, I'm the one you're looking for. I'm the guy. Pay attention to me. But they didn't fulfill every detail of what was spoken of regarding the Messiah. So the bottom line is, they were false. They were fake. They were want-to-be's, if you want to look at it that way. You know, when we talk about the fulfillment of messianic prophecy, we have to understand that all of that prophecy has to be fulfilled. Not one or two or seven out of ten. All of that prophecy has to be fulfilled. Just that simple. That's why a couple of weeks ago when we started talking about the likelihood of one man fulfilling all of that, the number was just staggering to us. How could one man, what were the odds of one man fulfilling all of that prophetic word spoken about him? It was incomprehensible to us because in human eyes, we can't see it. It was all by divine design that God laid out every single detail of what was to come to pass, and Jesus, by God's divine design, his son fulfilled every single detail of what was written, or is still filling every single detail of what was written. God didn't provide one or two proofs 
of his son being the Messiah. He provided hundreds of proofs that Jesus is the Messiah. So let's get to it this morning. We are going to dig through a couple Old Testament scriptures again. We're going to look at their New Testament connection this morning. And we're going to talk about how Jesus fits in to that prophetic message. First of all, understand that there is a whole lot in the Old Testament regarding healing and sickness and disease. There are several, several, several scriptures we can look at regarding those. You can go back as far as Exodus and you'll read information about God's healing hand. Exodus uh, 15 gives you just an example of it. He said, if you listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his command and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. There are many other Old Testament references just like that one that we are not going to dig into this morning. They talk about healing, they talk about the Lord's touch, but they are not prophetic in terms of the coming of the Messiah and the the fulfillment of the Messiah. We are going to look at ones that speak directly to evidence of the Messiah this morning. Two scriptures in particular that we are going to read through this morning, both in the book of Isaiah. So turn there if you haven't already this morning. We'll read through them in just a minute. These two scriptures do indeed speak prophetically to the healing that can be seen in and through the Messiah, Jesus. Before we read these scriptures, let me say something very clearly this morning. There is a tremendous amount of information in the text of the chapters that we are going to read from this morning. But we are only going to read like three verses this morning. I encourage you to open up the Word later today, tomorrow, whenever your quiet time is. Go back and read through the text in Isaiah. Get an understanding of everything that he's talking about there. Because there is countless things that are referenced in the book of Isaiah, even specifically in these particular scriptures. Our first one that we're going to read today is Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 18. It says, In that day the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. The second one we're going to read is a couple of chapters later. Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah 35, starting at verse 5. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Two scriptures I'm sure many of us have heard or possibly even quoted many times in our lives. But there's a few different aspects of healing we're going to look at in reference to these two verses this morning. All prophetic in nature and all of them fulfilled or being fulfilled in the Messiah. So the first one we're going to take a look at this morning one that has already come to pass and and continues on, but one that has already come to pass and work is physical healing in the life of a believer. From the physical perspective, the Messiah would indeed bring healing to the people around him. Physical, fleshly healing. It was a sign of who the Messiah was was it was something they would see in the individual who was called the savior the deliverer it would be something for them to look at specifically just as much as the virgin birth or the call out of egypt or the rejection by others that we've already talked about this too the fact that he was healing people was a sign for them to see 
He did many wonders and miracles. Healing was one of those tangible things that people saw the Savior do. We do know that Scripture also tells us that one would go out ahead of the Messiah to announce His coming. And we all know that to be John the Baptist, right? John was the one that went out and said, one comes after me. Okay? John the Baptist. At some point, John had a question go through his mind. A question that he verbalized and brought out. Now maybe it's because Jesus was so different than what anybody ever expected. That, that he was not what they envisioned when they thought of Messiah. We don't know, but for some reason John poses this question. He says, are you the one? Are you the one that is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Listen to Jesus' response. It's written in Matthew chapter 11. It says, when John heard in prison that Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples and asked him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. John knew of the prophecies that spoke about the coming of a Messiah. And some would say that John posed this question because he was looking for proof. He wanted to know, to know, to know that Jesus was the man. Can you confirm that you are the one? And Jesus beautifully responds to John's question by calling all the attention to what had been seen and heard about the Messiah. Visible, clear evidence. Not something that was up for debate. Not something that could go back and forth with discussion. But tangible proof that the Messiah was healing as was spoken about hundreds of years before by the prophets. While the recipients of that healing may not have been thinking in this way, they were part of the evidence proving that Jesus was the Messiah. I'm sure from a personal perspective we can all think about it like this. We want the healing because we want to be healed. Right? I think that's pretty safe to say. They weren't any different then. That guy with the bum leg or the shriveled hand or the blind eye, he, just, he wanted to be made well. But they became the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. We see this again in the Gospel of John, and I love this. This, this is so clear here. There's an incredible account of an individual there who is healed of his blindness. And this is specifically about a man who was born blind. No accident, no disease, no mishap or anything else. The man was born blind. From birth, he could not see. And I'm not going to give you the whole story today. We'll go through it quickly. Jesus spit into the dirt. He made up some mud. He rubbed it in the guy's eyes and then told him to go wash. When the guy obediently did that, he received his sight. Was it the mud that healed? Was it the water that healed? It was all because of Jesus, the Messiah. The man was obedient to what Jesus told him to do and he went and he washed and he see again. Now the leaders of the day, and remember we've used that reference before, the leaders, we're talking about the religious leaders, the guys who should know, 
the leaders of the day didn't really believe him. They didn't trust him. They questioned him. They wanted to know what really happened. Who really did this? How did you really get to see? They challenged him. They asked him. They dragged his parents in and said, is this really your son? Was he really born blind? I mean, they they did everything they could do to question this. But the man who received his sight from Jesus said this, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. I was blind and now I see. And this man is the man that made that happen. Jesus is the one who gave me my sight back. If you keep reading through that account in John, you get down a little further to verse 30 and it says this, even after the leaders are still questioning him and probing him, it says this. Uh, the man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a blind man before. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were seeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. They were not willing to listen, to receive, to see the signs that were right in front of them. This account of the blind man gives us just a pristine picture of the blatant disregard of prophetic text by by supposed believers, by supposed chosen people. They were supposed to know the Old Testament Scriptures and the law which spelled out all these things and yet they did not pay attention to them. They did not listen to Isaiah when he said the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped when they will, the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. They didn't pay attention to that scripture, to that sign given to them. There's no doubt that physical healing was one of the signs that pointed to the Messiah. We said in this text that there are a few different uh, prophetic messages, and so I want to share a couple of other aspects with you this morning. The second aspect that we can see regarding healing is yet to come. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Understand, while physical earthly healing is clearly a sign of the Messiah, the real healing comes when we stand face to face with our God. When the old order has passed away and we are made completely new in the presence of our Savior. See, that's an even greater healing than any physical healing we can receive while we are here. And it is still a healing provided by the Messiah. A healing that awaits all of us when we enter into His presence. See, there's something we need to remember. We don't always like to think about it this way, but we need to remember this. A physical, bodily healing here on earth, while it is an absolutely beautiful thing, it's not the healing any of us should really be longing for. See, every human being on earth will someday perish. At least the Lord come first. If he comes back and calls us home, then we won't feel that or experience that. But 
for the most part, every person will experience the death of their physical bodies. Even those who have been healed from some of the most horrific diseases, their flesh will someday still die. But the eternal healing that we will see when we stand face to face with our Savior is a healing that will never, ever, ever fade away. It will never, ever change. It will last, just as the Word says, eternally, forever. And it's a healing that we receive from the Messiah when we stand in His presence. Before we close up or finish out this morning, there's one more idea of healing that I want us to think about. This too is represented in the text we read from Isaiah. And it, the Gospel of John repeats it. In fact, it follows the account we just talked about a few minutes ago with the blind man, the one that was born blind from birth. In that last section of Scripture, in John chapter 9, he goes on to talk about another form of blindness. One that is worse than any other blindness. Immediately you've got to ask the question, how can one blindness be worse than another? Blind is blind, right? Not in this case. Because here Scripture talks about spiritual blindness. Being blind to our own sinful condition. Being blind to the fact that we need a Redeemer, a Savior, a Messiah in our lives. Being blind to recognize the signs that have been given to us regarding the Messiah. Spiritual blindness many times is caused when we're full of arrogance and pride and self-centeredness and we refuse to see our own shortcomings or our own sins let's look at john chapter 12 talks about this a little bit even after jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence they still would not believe in him. Spiritual blindness. This was to fulfill the words of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe because as Isaiah said elsewhere, he had blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so that they could neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Spiritual blindness is a horrific form of blindness. But there is still a healing available for that blindness through the Messiah. A blindness spoken of by the prophets years ago, fulfilled in and through Jesus the Messiah. Physical healing, spiritual healing, evil healing. Three different aspects of healing, all spoken about in the Old Testament, all affirmed in the New Testament, all fulfilled or being fulfilled in the Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ. All of those healings, however you look at them, are all based on and driven by that incomprehensible love that the Messiah has for each and every one of us. That love that we talked about this morning.